at 2.40 p.m. on March 22, 2017, a 52-year-old Khalid Masood got into a gray Hyundai Tucson and proceeded to drive at speeds approaching 76 miles an hour into pedestrians along the sidewalks of the south side of Westminster Bridge. One of the victims, a Romanian tourist, was hit so hard that he was thrown right off the bridge into the River Thames. She later died in a hospital of her injuries. The car continued on, crashed into railings on the bridge at the north perimeter of the Palace of Westminster. Masood, wearing black clothes, got out of the car, ran towards the corner of the Parliament Square, through the open gates of the car open carriage gates, where he fatally stabbed an unarmed police officer, Keith Palmer. Masood then shot, was shot by an armed police officer and died at the scene. Six people, including the attacker, died that day as a result of this incident, and another 50 were injured. The entire attack from start to finish lasted 82 seconds. In a final text message, Masood said that he was waging jihad against the West on behalf of Muslim countries in the Middle East. In April of 2017, around 10.30 p.m., a 20-year-old man named Salam Sal Salman Ram Ramadan Alabed de detonated an improvised explosive device packed with nuts and bolts to act as shrapnel in the foyer of Manchester Arena. The attack took place as 14,200 people were exiting the Ariana Grande concert. The blast killed the attacker and 22 concert goers and parents in the entrance waiting to pick up their children following the show. 119 people were injured. The dead included 10 people under 20, the youngest an eight-year-old child. On May 3rd, 2017, ISIS took credit for that attack. At 9.58 p.m., June 3rd, 2017, a white van traveling across London Bridge and containing 18 petrol bombs mounted the sidewalk slamming into pedestrians. The van crashed and three male occupants wearing fake explosive vests ran to a nearby borough market pub and restaurant area where they stabbed people with long knives. While they did this, the attackers shouted, this is for Allah. The three attackers were shot dead by armed officers from the Metropolitan and City of London Police outside White Chief Pub, eight minutes after the initial 999 emergency call was made. In that eight minutes, eight people were killed, 48 were injured, 21 critically so. In the wake of these attacks, one apologist got on the, at least one apologist got on the TV saying, we shouldn't hate Muslims. They worship the same God that we do. That indeed, Christians, Jews, and Muslims all worship the same God. Is that true? In our Bible passage today, it says, Go, there, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. If Christianity and Muslims worship the same God, are we supposed to do that too? Is it through violent means, suicide bombs, stabbings, that we are to make disciples of all nations? Is this what attracts people to our religion? Is this what makes God great? Our opening word for the day that we all said together said, God is love. If God is love, and we worship the same God as the Muslims and Jews, how can a loving God ask his followers to blow themselves up, taking with them an eight-year-old girl? 
Do we worship the same God as the Jews and the Muslims? I can understand why some people might say so. The Torah, the Jewish Holy Scriptures, account for the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Jesus was born to a Jewish family, and his teachings are saturated with Old Testament Scripture. As for Islam, they trace their lineage back to Abraham of the Old Testament. Abraham is the link in the chain of prophets that begins with Adam and culminates with Muhammad. Starting in Genesis 16 of the Bible, Abraham, or Abram as he then was called, was chosen by God to be the father of a great nation. But ten years later, he and his wife Sarah still didn't have any children. His wife then offered her Egyptian handmaiden Hagar to Abram with the intention that Hagar would bear him a son. Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. But about a year later, Sarah, Abraham's wife, gave birth to Isaac. And then, as you might imagine, there was drama in the house. Sarah eventually demands that Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael away. Where? She doesn't care, just away. Abraham only does so when God promises to bless Ishmael. And while the Old Testament and the Bible follow the line of Abraham through Isaac, the Muslims trace the prophets back to Abraham through Ishmael. So all that being said, I can see where some people say that we worship the same, the same God. But if that is true, we certainly have a very different opinion as to who that God is. The differences in our concept of who God is, in my mind, is just too great for us to say that we worship the same God. The Christian God, described in the Old Testament and New Testament, is not the same as, as Islam's Allah. And the Jewish concept of God, because they rejected Jesus Christ, is no longer complete. While there are many differences, the main difference between Judaism, Islam, and Christianity is that we worship a triune God which is why we sang holy, holy, holy at the beginning of the service. This goes to the very nature of who God is, of who we are, his children, how we worship him, and how we treat one another. Last week, Gail and Graham got baptized. And while I was sprinkling the water and messing up Graham's hair in the process, I said to them, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ in our passage today said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You notice the last words that he said to the disciples is, he didn't say, baptize them in my name. No. He said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity. Christianity alone, amongst the world's faiths, teaches that God is a triune God. The doctrine of the Trinity is that God is one being who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland, used to use the shamrock to try to explain the Trinity. Three distinct leaves but one body, one stem. The Trinity means that God is, in its very essence, relational. If you were to read the Gospel of John, chapter 17 and 18, you'll hear Jesus saying, the Holy Spirit gives glory to the Son, in turn the Son glorifies the Father, and the Father glorifies the Son and that this has been going on for all eternity. Three persons glorifying the other. What does the term glorify mean? To glorify something or someone is to praise, enjoy, delight in them. If you run a business, 
You want your employees around because you need them to run your business and to make you money. But if you're a father, you want your wife and your children and your grandchildren around simply because their very presence brings you joy and delight. You want them with you, not because of what they can do for you, but because of who they are, the people that you love most in this world. To glorify something or someone means that you sacrifice to make them happy. Why? Because your ultimate joy is to bring them happy. Happiness and joy. Now, folks, I don't know what that looks like at a cosmic level and supernatural level. But I want you to think about Christmas. And your child wants a special gift. It's going to cost you more than you can really afford. And in January, you might have a hard time paying the bills. Or it might mean you have to work some extra overtime. But you buy the gift anyway. Because you know just how happy it will make them feel. What does it look like? I remember when I was young. My mother and I would, would get in our car. Well, her car wasn't mine. And we'd drive six hours from Halifax to Glace Bay to visit my grandmother. The entire time, I couldn't wait. Because I knew when I got there, there'd be fried chicken homemade chocolate chip cookies and a great big hug waiting for me but I ran into the house my grandmother would would spend her time getting together the things that I love the most and I would spend my entire time in anticipation knowing that when I got to that place it was a host of love What does it look like? A couple of weeks ago, Ruth went to Cape Breton to visit her father and daughters. The entire time she was gone, I couldn't wait for Ruth to come back. Why? Well, because of supper. No. (laughs) Why? Because my life just isn't the same without her present, without her being there. What does that sound like? It sounds like love. The very essence of God is love. Just like we all read together for our word for the day from from 1 John. The Holy Spirit loves and sacrifices for the Son. The Son loves and sacrifices for the Father. And the Father loves and sacrifices for the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so it has been For all eternity. Of all the world's religions, only the Christian God of the Bible says that God is love. The entire idea that God is love comes from Jesus Christ and our faith. The very essence of the Christian God of the Bible is love. That's not the same for the Jewish or the Muslim God. For them, God is one person. Unipersonal. If that is the case, then until God created other beings, there was no love. Since love is something that one person has for another. This means until the universe was created, there was no love at all. But God was missing that from its being. This means that a unipersonal God, if it was missing that from its being, the essence of that God cannot be love. Instead, it was power and greatness for all eternity. In order to create a universe, you have to have power, you have to have greatness. That was the essence of God, not love. Love, therefore, is not the, love then is not the essence of their God, nor was it at the heart of the universe. Power was. For the triune God of Christianity, loving relationships are the foundation of the universe. 
For the unipersonal God, the monotheistic God of the Jews and Muslims, power and strength are the foundation of the universe because that is the essence of their God. And we see this in the way they worship, in the way that they live in this world. You see, Muslims have to work their way into heaven. Through their actions and devotion, they have to show that they are worthy of Allah's acceptance. They must work their way into heaven to be closer to God. They have to show Allah that they are devoted enough, that they are disciplined enough to receive salvation. Only the strongest of character, devotion, and discipline will be saved. That is why they have jihads. That is why there are terrorist attacks. That is why there are honor killings. Power and strength is the essence of their God. That is fundamentally different than Christianity. The Son of God was born into this world to begin a new humanity, a new community of people who could lose their self-centeredness and put love at the center of their relationships with God and with one another. Paul calls Jesus the last Adam. You see, the first Adam was tested in the Garden of Eden. The last Adam, Jesus, was tested in the Garden of Gethsemane. The first Adam knew that, that he would live if he obeyed God about, a tr about the tree, but he didn't. The last Adam knew that if he obeyed God about the tree, the cross, that he would be crushed. And still he did. Why did Jesus die for us? What was Jesus getting out of it? And the answer to my friend is not a thing. He came into this world and died on the cross to deal with our sins. He was doing that. When he did that, he was doing, doing with us what he had been doing with the Father and the Spirit for all eternity loving us at the expense of his own interests. As John 17 says, I have given them the glory that you gave me. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity defines God in a way that is fundamentally different than God as understood by either the Jewish people or Islam. A God who's essentially different, uh, whose essential defining characteristic is not power, but love. So even though it can be very difficult for us to grasp the concept of the Trinity, it tells us that our God is a God of love and relationships. And that is what we should put first in our lives. In Genesis chapter 1, when it says we are created in God's image, it means that God created us also to have love, relationships, and community at the core of our being, both with him and with each other. When asked to summarize the law, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is our call. And it's rooted in the doctrine of the Trinity. Which we celebrate today. He says. Take a look what I've been doing for all eternity. Try to accomplish that in your own relationships. In your own life. In your own world. That is how you heal relationships. That is how you bring glory to God. That is how you live a life well lived. And so as we go about our lives, let us always remember that our core and God's core is love. It's relationship. It's community, both with God and with each other. And this is what we celebrate today. 
on Trinity Sunday, to which I can only say, thanks be to God, and amen. Let us bow our minds and hearts just for a quick moment in prayer. And let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you live and reign in perfect unity and love. Hold us firm in this faith that we may know you in all your ways and evermore rejoice in your holy and eternal glory who are three persons, yet one God. We ask that you be with the family of Mary Spencer, one of their own, one of their family, is no longer with them, but is now with you. At 93 and in failing health, they knew the time was coming. But Lord, even though we know it's coming, it's still hard to say goodbye. We ask that you be with those who are ill and infirm in our community, in our church. Help us to be the kind of people they need us to be at this time whether it's through thoughts or actions or prayers, whether it be close contact or more distant contact. Allow us to be the bearers of good news and be your children to them during this time of need. All this we ask you in Jesus' name, O Lord. Amen. Well, my friends, as we've come to the end of our time here together, I want to thank you for coming out and being part of our time. You know, Trinity Sunday is always, always a, a, a difficult Sunday to speak about. You speak about because it's mind-blowing. Three persons, one God. It's hard to wrap your mind around it and then express it in a 10, 15, 20-minute sermon. And so I was speaking to Reverend Frank about this the other day. And he said he always found the exact same challenge. How do you speak about something so grand and so glorious, which is the defining nature of our God and our faith, and do it in such a way to encapsulate it and give it justice during a short period of time? So if there's any questions you might have, I'm not going to entertain them right now. But if there's any questions you do have, I did write up something that I'm putting on my blog. It'll be there later on tonight or tomorrow. If you have questions or if you want to know a little bit more about the Trinity, my thoughts, for what they're worth, will be there.